Romy, welcome back. Thank you, Miriam. So happy to be back. Yes, I'm looking forward. Last time we spoke about psychological safety. Mm-hmm. And today we're speaking about experiential learning. Yeah. Yes. And we just warmed up our vocal cords with a little chit chat before we hit the record button. And you shared this beautiful sentence, I live by the rules of open space. <laughs> yes. Why don't you why don't we start with that? Okay. Yeah, let's kick it off. It is a warm-up question. Um, <laughs> because those who want to know when and why you started calling yourself a facilitator, listen to our first episode. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone doesn't know what open space technology is, it's an absolute great methodology. Highly recommend you to check it out. Should I give a little background on it? I sure I'll give a little background on it just to give some context. Um, if you don't know, it's it's essentially like the unconference. So a lot of facilitators, we love to use this approach. Um, the creator Harrison Owen, he basically said that he he felt like more richness and more impact often happens at conferences in the coffee breaks instead of in the actual conference and so he's like how could we transform the way we're gathering so that it always feels like a coffee break hence he created open space and uh so i love this I, it's actually a tool i love to use it's one of my favorite formats and like i just said i literally live by these rules of open space because i think any facilitator it's a great way to approach life um, and the four really key principles are whoever comes are the right people, right? So we're always, especially in this online space, thinking like, okay, maybe, I don't know, 100 people sign up, but then we only get 50 people there or vice versa. Now we have these interesting calendar invites and people just show up without registering. And so how as, you know, for me as a facilitator, I'm always trying to really be flexible and adaptable to whoever is there is the right people, even if it's one person, who knows, then that was the only, you know, that's the only thing that could have happened. Um, so whoever comes to the right people, um, whatever happens is the only thing that could have happened, right? So we often can go in with these expectations as facilitators of, okay, these are my desired outcomes. This is how I plan the session. It's going to go this way. And you know, I've really learned that we can love our design, but we need to love our, you know, our participants more and let their experience mm-hmm. speak for itself and be open to, hey, this could take a totally different detour. And that's okay. Like, how do we create space for that? Um, the other ones are whenever it starts is the right time. Okay. I will say that I have to give a little <laughs> disclaimer, right? I, I don't want to say I don't want to ever show up late to, to anything as a facilitator. But, um, you know, we often may, again, come in with these preconceived notions of this is when we're going to get to the meat of, you know, why we're here. And this is where things are really going to kick off or people are going to start engaging. And, you know, whenever it starts, maybe it happens in a different part. Maybe something else unfolds. Maybe the timing you originally not imagined, you know, totally, who knows, transforms. And so, yeah, just being open to that possibility as well as whenever it ends um what is what is it it's whenever it ends is the right time time for it to end yeah yeah exactly um so yeah I often you know even with an online I'm I'm always thinking about online but even in person like those extra moments at the end right when people Mm -hmm. come up to you and then it really you know cultivates new conversations and people connecting and all of a sudden you're there and a little one minute question at the end becomes like, who knows, a 30 minute nice and rich and nourishing discussion. So I, I really believe in all those. And the last ones, which are the law, there's only one law, which is the law of two feet or in the online space, I hear the, the law of two clicks, um, <laughs> which basically says you can be a bumblebee and you can really love to like get down to the work, really focus on one thing and stay laser focused. And some people like to be more butterfly. So in the open space context, this is nice. You can kind of float from session to session or be a bumblebee and stay in one particular session. But for me, what the real meaning behind that process is the law of two feet is really about if you feel that you are not directly contributing or not directly getting out of a session what you imagined, You have every right, well, in open space context, you have every right to leave and go someplace else where you feel that you could contribute more. I guess that becomes much more 
possible now in the online space. I see, you know, people can leave, but I also take it for me, a deeper meaning of like take ownership over your own learning. Right. And I think that's, what's so important as facilitators, we are, or trainers, or I believe anyone really in the learning space, we are not there to impose, we are there to cultivate from within and empower each learner in that space to take ownership over their own learning process. And if they're not getting something, how can I as a facilitator create a space where they feel they can contribute in a new way, they can maybe bring their new ideas, they could shift the program, or decide to actually facilitate something themselves, or who knows, create something totally different. Um, and I think all of those principles are life, you know, guideposts for us as facilitators, both in our, my, and for me, I think for sure in my personal, but also my, well, in my professional for sure. And also even my personal life, you know, life is full of uncertainties. If anything, the past three years has taught us is that, yeah. um, and how, how we approach it can make all the difference. Yeah. Wonderful. In this, yeah, adjusting to uncertainty, living, embracing uncertainty is one of the facilitation superpowers. And I think in what you describe, there's this open space mentality also embraces some of the basic principles of facilitation is that we acknowledge that the wisdom is in the room. And it's not only the speakers who are invited to a conference who have content to share, but every single participant, every single person who's in the space has potentially a workshop or a talk or a presentation or something in themselves that they could potentially share with others. Mm. And I think that's, um, it's beautiful to acknowledge. And I just wish that more, and maybe it's something that we have to grow into as facilitators, to grow into this relaxation that whoever the people who show up are the white people, and if it's only one person, that's okay. Um, I think there's a lot of, especially as you said, in the online space, so much anxiety and pressure around us to attract enough people to provide the right content um, and forgetting that everyone is actually self-responsible. If it's not for them, they can leave and it has nothing to do with us. Seriously. Yeah, I think part of being that facilitator is just you have to take your ego out, right? In every way, you have to put the participants' experience at the center. And as you said, that can look like the content um, I always talk about, right, we should not see ourselves as these, uh, not see our learners as these empty cups that we need to fill, but really see every single person walks in with years of life experience, knowledge, values, interests, behaviors, you know, stories that we can drink from. Everyone is mm -hmm. a full cup and we can drink from. And I see that also, like you said, the ego, there's this initial idea right of oh we're there to host the space we're there to you know lead and guide the group so that feels like oh we need to be we're on the spotlight um and it's something it's not an easy thing to do I'm not speaking that like oh this is so easy for me to <clears throat> like just kind of put myself as the guide on the side instead of you know being more front and center but I think the more I see myself doing that right the more the more um Again, ownership is the word that always comes up, but the more ownership you can put on learners to really like create the space and co-create the space, it becomes what comes out of those experiences are like 10 times more incredible and transformative than whatever I could have initially imagined by myself. Yeah. Um, just a short break. Could you put your hair, because I hear the... Oh, so your hair sorry. on the microphone. <laughs> oh no, do I need to re-record? Uh, no, it's it was minor, but I think if you have it for for an entire hour, I'm sorry. If anyone seeing this, I'm sorry if I hurt your ears. <laughs> awesome. And now just watch out that it's not your jacket. <laughs> okay. Oh, here is it better well, now? We do. <laughs> cool. Here we go. Awesome. Gordon, um, we're back on now. And I love the concept of the full cup. Everyone enters as a full cup already. And I think there's a beauty also in 
knowing that we can just share our full cups, we can get rid of a little bit of our content um, and replace it maybe as a as a trade show. Okay, I give you a little bit of mine. Can I have a little bit of yours? Mm. And I would be curious to hear from you how this then relates when you're stepping into the shoes of a trainer. And so the topic today is experiential learning. That's your big thing. That's what you do. And I wonder to what extent can you apply actually these open space principles when you are coming into the space as the subject matter expert, where you are basically paid and hired to fill people's cups? Hmm. Great question. I think <clears throat> I think that there's a lot of misconceptions when we use this word trainer, right? I think in the worlds that you and I know each other in, Miriam, and there's kind of this idea that, okay, if you're a facilitator, then you're using experiences and you're really, you know, creating these participant-centered approaches. But when you're a trainer, it's full-on lecture and subject matter expert. And if we look at the real theory behind experiential learning, we can see we can see that, well, I don't believe this to be true, but also, you know, when we look at the theory, it really shows us that as whether you call yourself a trainer or a presenter, um, we move through four different roles. One of them is a facilitator role. So basically that is, you know, if we think about the experiential learning cycle, which I'll mention in a, in a moment, you know, there's different, all these different aspects from whether we are uh, learner focused or subject focused, whether we're more on the meaning making or more action focused. And we want to adopt these four roles of facilitator, subject matter expert, uh, standard setter, or what I think now is called evaluator, mm. and coach to really help move learners through all of those different areas and focuses. And so I really believe that all trainers must have facilitation skills because that is still a key part. You know, I proudly call myself a trainer because I really am trying to fully embody all four of those roles. I want to be a facilitator. I want to guide people through those experiences and processes. I need to be um, proactively asking the right questions to draw the meaning from those experiences. But I also, I don't end there, right? Like this is, you know, what we think of typical facilitate. When I think of typical facilitation from the context of this experiential learning theory, it's really experience focus and then debriefs to draw mm -hmm. the meaning. I go further as a trainer because now I, I say, okay, there might be small nuggets where I am a, a subject matter expert. People are there to learn something particularly from me. So I will share nuggets of knowledge and information, but there's many different ways you can do this. You don't only have to do it through lectures, right? Um, and then I'm also moving through the other roles of evaluation. How am I evaluating or stand uh, setting standards for my learners so I can understand you know, what is it, what are the, the, what's the baseline of what they know or that they are doing before we have our training and how can we measure that progress and growth over time so that we can actually say, Hey, now we're helping you achieve your goals. Mm. And the last role is again, the coach, because the coach role is about focusing on that again, the learner focus, but with that action focus, which is often very much can be missing is how do we take the learning forward? So it's not just, it's, you know, sometimes you can do this in an actual event and really taking a more personalized approach for individuals to help them and their progress. And sometimes this also happens even outside of a standalone training. And it's like, how do we keep the learning going over time? I personally don't do like so much of these one. Well, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consulting. I never, I don't know. It's still hard for me to call myself a coach because this word, again, we have a lot of preconceived notions, but it's just really about supporting our learners in all these different facets with these four roles. That's for me, what I see as a true trainer um, compared to, to um, facilitator. So if I, mm. Thank you. 
so if I understand it correctly, for you, in the best of all worlds, every trainer is an experiential learner, learning facilitator. Yeah, of course. It's one of the key aspects. I don't, I don't think, yeah, in order to be an experiential trainer, you have to be able to adopt that facilitator role because we, we need it. Um, but again, then many people consider trainings uh, that don't need facilitation skills because they think, okay, you're just standing at a room. There's like movie theater style and you're just presenting information. Yeah. Then I, I, maybe you call yourself a trainer, but I would not be able to call you an experiential trainer from my, okay. from my personal lens. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I tried to wrap my head around the concept of experiential learning as training plus facilitation. And now I learned it's um, maybe rather lecturing or presenting plus facilitation plus coaching <laughs> and evaluation yeah exactly. yeah yeah and you mentioned the experiential learning cycle and i would love you to walk us through that and and I would be very curious to your understanding or even definition of what would you consider an experience? Mm. Because I can imagine that there might be some who think, oh, experience, it's kind of extravagant. It's loud, it's colorful, it's music, it's performance. It's, or it's, or maybe it can be very small. Maybe does it have to be multi-central? sensory mm. all these uh, questions are coming up and think of experience yes okay so um let's there's so many different aspects here right so let's start with the core of experiential learning is what is an experience like you just asked so the way that again one i just want to say that this is not something that I just made up. There is, again, there's a real theory behind this. And I can, who was, it was originally created, actually, it's now been over 50 years that David Kolb is the original creator and founder of experiential learning theory based on, again, tons of uh, learning scholars from many, 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 many years. And I, I need to just stress this because these I use his definitions because I think there are constant mis misunderstandings about what experiential learning actually is. Is it just fun? Is it just fluff? It's interactive. It's engaging. Therefore, it's experiential. I it, it sometimes hurts my soul how often I see this word just like thrown around without people really understanding, you know, what is an experience and then how, what is experiential learning? So let's do that here right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, David Kolb, he basically describes an experience as anything new that strikes the learner, this concept of striking a learner. Um, it has to tap into, as you said, senses, emotions, um, novelty, uh, uh, presence, being fully immersed in experience means we're, we're fully present, right? And it's something he uses this word struck um, again, because when you, I, I always love to also ask this word in debrief. So like what struck you? Because mm -hmm. everyone is going to share something totally different. Some people might talk more about it was the emotions that struck them, or it could be actually more the ideas that pr present that struck them because they were new, or it was different sensations. And an experience really is something that immerses you in that. It doesn't need to be, like you said, this big, you know, we create, we can create these huge, massive experiences and gatherings of tons of people and all the different, I don't know, crazy interesting holograms I've seen all all the kinds of you know futuristic experiences um, but if we even take it in the smallest sense an experience could actually be a breakout room discussion but it's a new ex it's an experience that is, strikes somebody because in some way it's new or it evokes new emotion so an experience would not be a breakout room discussion where you're introducing yourself because mm -hmm. you can really do this on autopilot at this point you're kind of like 
yeah, I'm Romy. I'm a learning experience designer, experiential learning trainer. That's something I've probably said, I don't know, millions of times by now. But if someone is asking me a thought provoking question that I've never thought about, or someone like we're talking about putting our learners in the center, somebody is sharing in a breakout room, something that I've never thought about that, wow, maybe deeply resonate. Somebody's, you know, mentioning a really vulnerable or really personal story that, you know, gets to the core of my emotions. That could in itself be in a very small scale. It's still an experience because people can draw meaning from any of these experiences. Mm. So I hope that gives a bit of context there. Totally, totally. And then we can create experiences by asking the right question. Yeah. I think when I, I always kind of look at it in these two categories of more, ref I don't know if it's the, I haven't actually ever fully formulated the words here. So bear with me as I talk it out, but it's more like, question probing but more reflective maybe more like restorative in a way of like meaning making and yeah an experience can be those questions and discussions but we also want to part of you know learning and processes we want to create lots of novelty we want variety and so we also want to create some more high energy maybe it's about the energies right these mm. low energy and then the high energy of like How do we make an experience that feels like it's much more than a discussion? We're actively involving, we're using our bodies, we're, you know, getting really deep into immersive somatic practices, you know, mm -hmm. all of that, that then brings up um, a different kind of experience. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent it's also about how, and when you actually share the content with the group. And I wonder whether, because in the traditional lecture education style, you share content and then you test. Did you understand what I'm saying? Can you paraphrase? Can you synthesize? Or can you fill in the multiple choice? And in my understanding of experiential learning and I'm a novice, so please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the learners experience something and through that experience, they understand what the content is about yes. more than being told what it's about. Exactly. I mean, we'll get into this, but I think it, let's, let's first look at, you know, how, again, how David Kolb defines experiential learning. So he says, learning is the process whereby knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. Mm, okay. Yeah. So the experience comes first. Again, I've also had interesting talks with him. He says it doesn't necessarily have to go in that order he does believe that as long as you have all the different elements I'll touch upon now it can still be considered experiential but he also says if we want to yield the highest impact then we do go in that order and I oh personally I always start with experience because I really believe that we have to let those experiences speak for themselves like human beings we are just not No one is ever sold on something if you just tell them this is the truth. This is why experiential learning works is because it actually follows the patterns in our brain and how we think. Mm -hmm. When we experience something, that's when it really lands. I can read a book. I can you know, hear a lecture. I can watch a movie, all of this. But the only reason why a lot of that clicks with us is because we've had an experience that can either prove it to be true or we can connect it back to like, wait a second, was that my experience? What happened? Because mm. I had something else happen. This is how that's we are. true for us because that's <laughs> the only truth we know is what we feel basically. Exactly. Yeah. And so the beauty of experiential learning is not just that it maximize engagement or it puts the participants full experiences in the forefront and in the center um but that it also it also follows like i said the neuroscience of learning and how we learn and so and not enough people know that right like i i i spent many years early on in my career designing and and facilitating sessions without really understanding like how does how do we learn 
And it was through looking for making learning more effective that I was like, oh, this is it. This is the underlying foundation. And so let's just quickly, I'd like to kind of walk into these four, you know, what this experiential learning cycle is. As we already said, those four different educator roles, by adopting those roles, we go through the cycle. And there's, again, not lucky number four, there's four different modes of the cycle. And so, again, because experiential learning is about tr the transformation of experience, we can think of kind of these two poles that are really, um, there's a lot of tension between grasping new experience through these new experiences that you're creating or even through knowledge um or you know maybe it's it's more just the grasping space it could be through experiences or through the knowledge or information that is shared but then we need to do something with it we need to transform it and so basically the four modes are this experiencing level i always like to think of the visual of your heart right because as we know now from experiences we need to tap into our emotions our senses all of that is really that experiencing phase so we already gave examples um but yeah it could be from you know if again i always love to take an even meta approach like in life mm. you can have a on a small level a discussion you can have a medium of an experience a somatic embodied practice um but in life you can say okay this whole this whole training or this whole chapter of my life was one experience now what have i learned from it right so there's so this is the beauty of, of the cycles of spiral what comes next from the experiences is reflecting. Like you said, we need to draw meaning from it. Otherwise, the learning doesn't stop. This is, again, a huge miscon... Um, uh, the learning doesn't um, fulfill itself because this is a huge misconception that experiential learning is just learning by doing. Mm. If we were just doing learning by doing, we would just stay in that experiencing mode. But it's not. Uh, John Dewey, who was another very uh, prominent scholar of experiential learning and contributed uh, to David Kolb's work, he said that like we don't learn by doing, we learn by um, practice, or we learn through the reflection of an experience, right? And mm -hmm. that's where that meaning making happens. So in the reflecting zone, people need to see this where we, as facilitators, we often debrief, right? What just happened for you? What kind of emotions came up? Or what did you notice and observe? Or what learning are you taking from that? Um, and then we go into the thinking phase. This is the third mode. I keep calling it phases lately. And it's not phase because you can mix and match, but I, I use them as phases. They're modes, technically, uh, modes of the cycle. And in the thinking uh, mode, it's this really where, right, we're grasping new information. So here's where trainers can really tie in an experience learners had. Now they've drawn meaning from it. And now I'm maybe tapping more into that subject matter expert role of saying, like, here's new insights. So I don't know if I was doing a training on facilitation, I might put people first into an experience where they have to just quickly facilitate then reflect maybe what did you learn um, or what did you take away from your own facilitation? And that would be now the thinking phase. I'm going to say, here's some of the top tips that I've learned through my experience of facilitation. But then it often ends there, right? And it's often like, okay, thank you very much. Now you got your top tips. Okay, we go. And we can't end there. We have to complete the cycle. And that's where the acting phase comes in. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're really starting to adopt more that coaching approach of like, what are you going to do? How can you take what you've learned here in, from the whole piece, not just from my lecture, but from all of those different modes of the cycle? And what are you going to use and apply moving forward? And oftentimes, you know, we limit it to like one intention, one takeaway, but we can really build out that mode even more in our session. So in that same example I just gave you, we might then say, okay, now you're going to facilitate again and put into practice what you've learned. Yeah, That really makes the learning come alive because we need that deliberate practice. We need to, you know, not just say, okay, I'm going to do something, but then actually do it. And then a new experience comes because they could draw new meaning from that, yeah. et, cetera, et cetera. And you basically, you give them a new pair of glasses um, and then through the lens, they can see different things. And yeah, and make meaning of it, and then it sticks. And I wonder 
whether so one thing that crossed my mind was oh the way you described experiential learning especially focused on facilitation is like okay this is the most natural way to 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 train facilitation because that's so ingrained in what we do um do an exercise be in there deep breathe try it yourself or get some nuggets and then try it yourself and then the next thing that crossed my mind was there's so many online learnings now facilitation so question is it possible to have an an experiential learning experience experience experiential <laughs> learning course <laughs> uh -huh. that is asynchronous mm, great question so I've actually been, because I'm my specialization is really in experiential learning, I've actually been brought in and consulted with quite a few number of ed tech companies who exactly want that. They are curious on how can we make an app or a self-paced course experiential? And you can. I mean, the, the answer is you can. It's always going to be a different exper kind of experience than you would have if you have a group, of course. But it doesn't mean, you know, unfortunately, again, if we look at the typical and you know, average self-paced course, um, it's often, again, just watch these videos. It's one directional. It's we're yeah. just in that thinking phase in, where you need you to grasp new information, but you're not transforming it in any way, shape or form. Because our cups are already full. Exactly. <laughs> you see? And, uh, and this is why, you know, some, some things that I've done that's been really successful is even with a self-paced course, how do you still find this sense of community and connection mm -hmm. with other learners who are taking it from their own home? Um, you don't necessarily need to have, you know, a, a virtual or a live component. It can really help there's a lot of research that actually shows that just having that sense of community is what holds people accountable it's the number one reason people actually take these courses even if they don't realize it themselves um but just you know one thing that i've i've done with an ed tech company which was really cool was we were constantly asking questions right so and people could submit their answers and then even in the app, there would be like these word clouds coming to live of like, here's, you know, 1000 people who've taken this course and here's the live word cloud of what's come out of this um, or having having opportunities for the learners to record their own um, podcast audio messages, having them record their own videos as well. So people can actually see the face behind like, oh, I'm not the only one in this course and mm. other people are here and having, again, having them connected back to their own experience, I think is so important. It's about, you know, looking at that full cycle, how can we create experiences, even if it's like fun, I don't know, mix and match things or test your own skills or a way that again, learners have to, the, the onus is on them to engage or to have a new experience that then they can reflect on or say, you know, here's what I took away from this. Here's what I learned even from a little, it could be as simple as a quiz. Okay, but now here's here's new content coming in. And the acting is so cool because you can give participants a challenge. It goes back to exactly what we were talking about at the beginning. How do we create more ownership on our learners so that they really feel like I'm co-creating this experience? I can't force anyone to do something, but I can say, okay, take whatever you learned here and now like make a challenge and now go do it and come back next week. And then you can reflect on how that was. Like, what did you actually do? What did you try out? You know, hold them accountable to share their learnings in whatever that course is so that they actually go out in the real world and start putting their learning into practice. Yeah. And I'm wondering where so let me start differently i think in the past there was this big assumption that there are different types of learners so some learn by reading others learn by speaking others learn by writing and the others learn by listening right so the different senses and if i remember correctly there was also research saying okay that's total bs 
Um, we all learn through all these ways. How do you then, and I would assume then that you still have to cover all these different senses in the learning journey. So to really make it stick, how would you then do it in the online or offline context? Or what can we keep in mind when we design our experiential learning courses? Totally. So there's two, I think, really great questions that are I'm, I'm unpacking with your question. So the first one just is about learning styles. I, I got to talk about this one. Um, so yes, I also, I think so many, I still know educators that go to master programs to learn about learning and people are still teaching about VARC, this, you know, visual auditory reading, writing, kinesthetic kind of learner and these learning styles saying, and, and learners use it a lot as an excuse. Like I couldn't learn in the session because I'm a visual learner and this wasn't visual. Right. And it's, it's not only completely false, like you said, there's no research behind it, but it's so it becomes a, a disempowering approach for everyone because, you know, there's this idea of like, okay, find out what kind of learning style and then your educators are going to, or trainers, or facilitators are going to, um, you know, use that approach to really reach your learner. So I'll only use visual for you if you say you're visual but you're right. Like I've actually had lots of conversations with neuroscientists um, who said we we all need all of them, right? Like we're always, this is how we all can, we know a lot about brain science and how kinesthetic movement can really fire neurons and help us remember things. But if we just do one of those or a couple of those, we're not maximizing learning. I'll go into how I do that um, in online courses and different things in a moment. But I just want to say, you know, again, going back to experiential learning theory, David Kolb actually coined the term learning styles 50 mm. years ago. And unfortunately, it was taken so out of context and people have used this. I mean, he's not connected to VARC, but he coined the term learning styles. And it's gone on now to, to where it is that he's now feeling 50 years later. He's like, I'm trying to change the language because we talk all the time about experiential learning styles. But now the, what we're trying to express to people is these are really learning preferences around the experiential learning cycle. Mm -hmm. So the same way I just explained to you the four modes of experiencing, reflecting, thinking, and acting, every single learner has preferences of where they feel most comfortable. So some people may love that experiencing part and they just, oh, they could stay there all the session. It just feels so good. Others might really love the reflecting and more like observation mode to draw the meaning from it. And others might be like, I really love the practical, the acting, putting things approach. Everyone has a preference. But the problem lies in when we cater to those preferences. And we say, because you are comfortable and you could stay in this part of the cycle, we're going to only feed you this. The reality is, it's as you know, it's our job as facilitators, as trainers, as anyone in the learning space to challenge our learners, to put our learners in the challenge zone. That's where really we can maximize learning. Because if we stay in our comfort zone, we're not actually maximizing our potential. So we have, I believe, a responsibility to go fully through the cycle with the four modes so that there's this interesting tension again of these parts I'm really comfortable and these parts, oof, this one, I am not feeling this or oof, I just can't wait for this part to be over. That's necessary because we need to develop everyone's learning flexibility and that's mm. the ultimate goal. And so when I talk about the learning style, the, when I talk about learning styles, I really mean that the cold experiential learning styles, I won't go through them. There's nine of them because they're, they're basically, we're not in the magic four anymore um, because basically it could be um, any one of the four modes, but then you also have other ones in between each mode. And then you also have a balancing mode. So mm -hmm. some people may be like in that imagining space, which is that mix between an experiencing and reflecting that they could just love to get in that imagining space and ideate ideas all day long and get creative and tap into those emotions and senses, but also start reflecting with meaning. And others could be on the opposite side of the end of like decision making, which is less about this, you know, all the different ideas, but more like 
I love to be near the thinking or the acting of like, what are we going to do? Let's make those decisions. So everyone has preferences, but we need to really develop our learning flexibility around it. Mm. Then I'll go, I'll, I want to make sure I'm not oh, talking like crazy, like a, a stereotypical trainer. So I'll, I want to <laughs> hear some of your reflections first before I then answer your second question about kinesthetic and all that in the online space. I like the term of um, e that it's learning styles and uh, no learning preferences um, because preference, I mean, looking at our own preferences, it's not black and white. It's uh, very nuanced and that's what I hear in it. Um, and I like the learning flexibility. It, it sounds like a muscle that you can, that you must train. And what yeah. I hear is, getting out of the comfort zone. And what it reminds me of is that we learn through emotions and we learn when we have, we learn through the process of struggling and then achieving. And that's a muscle memory we are building, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when I think of, I'm back into running. Mm. So, um, and I take it seriously. And what I realized is that there, I could either go the easy route is just doing always the same, but then from time to time, I need to do the sprints in order to become faster. And from time to time, I need to slow down to an extreme that I'm almost bored in order to increase the, the possibility to run for longer. And I can imagine from what I hear from you is that it's very similar than with the learning styles, that if I want to expand my capacity to learn, I have to train this flexibility to bend into something that feels uncomfortable. Absolutely. And that's why there is so much power in the self-awareness of understanding, like, what are my learning preferences? What is my, you know, where do I gravitate towards? Because there's tremendous strengths, like each, there's no style that's better or worse than others, right? Everyone brings something really unique and interesting. Where it gets, where I find things get quite interesting, actually, is when we think about when are we in situations that we're overusing our style, right? When you're mm -hmm. overusing these strengths, like, for example, I'm initiating learning style. So I'm in between the experiencing and the acting. And so I like one of my strengths is that I can be very flexible and adaptable in the moment, like, things could, you know, I think this is probably why open space principles really resonate with me, right? Like anything could happen. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to adapt. We're going to flex. I'm cool with it. Um, and um, I noticed that on the opposite side of the scale is the analyzing, right? Like creating these really structured, planned, um, you know, very, really looking at all the possibilities and analyzing and then putting it into a very clear and concise structured order. And, you know, I, 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 that, that mode, that learning style is definitely the farthest from the comfort for me, but it's the one I actually need to go forward towards because mm -hmm. when I overuse my initiating learning style and my strength, it can start to become a weakness because it's like, oh, you know, there was a period where it's like, do I need to make a structure? To use to just... wing it. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm so comfortable winging Facilitate it. Facilitate a disease. Yeah. <laughs> And then I realized I need to find some structure. I need to really start taking more intentional time to make those structures so that I am envisioning all the possibilities so that I am, I can enhance my work even more. It's about that interesting balance, right? Of having a structure, but then yeah. being able to wing it when I need to, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. that's why learning flexibility is something we all should be striving for. Love that. And, and then finding opportunities or possibilities to mix and match the different ones. So I realize, for instance, yesterday I spoke to a friend and she mentioned that she she purchased an ebook and on the first page they said, okay, it's nice that you have the ebook. We really recommend to also buy the audible, the audiobook version, and then to listen to it while reading. Like, oh, that's interesting because it really forces you to 
to focus mm -hmm. um, because our mind tends to just go places either when we just read or just listen. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Because we were speaking about the fact that we read all these pop science books and then don't remember what was actually in them. And I started to listen to the Blinkist after having finished the book, just as a reminder or a refresher. I don't like just the short version because it does it lacks substance. Yeah. Um, but as a reminder, it's kind of a complementary learning style to listen to it after having read it. Um, I think I think this is, you know, I I see those four modes of those are like different modes of delivery. I see it as a different for me, they're very distinct from like experiential learning styles that are like yeah. yeah. But I I think as you said, there's such potential in like why are people limiting themselves to just your reading writing? I mean, I think your friend that idea is great because yeah, how do we listen and read at the same time I'm the more that for example in online presentations I can say something what I say is clearly written on the screen not like tons of different writing that people are trying to observe information while listening so then gets cognitive overload but actually like here's the quote here's you're reading it you're hearing it and I'm going to ask you to do a body movement to mm -hmm. like express how, you know, what that comes alive for you. All of a sudden we're tapping into more potential for our learning because people will remember those movements and connect it with the content. Yeah. And what just comes to my mind is that more and more books now apply or try to introduce some experiences by having worksheets after a chapter or asking to reflect or asking to summarize or to go out and do something and then jump on our readers only page and share a comment mm -hmm. so and exactly. then suddenly it becomes an experience and they invited them to debrief on the experience exactly I think that's the beauty of it right like an experience could be again if we take a more high level approach it could be hey I just read this article and it struck me like it's something happened there it struck me but it's true. I will. It will start to dissipate, and I'll lose it if I don't tell someone about it. If I don't spend a moment to reflect on it for myself. If I don't, I don't know, transform it in a different way that it's like, hey, I just read this, and now I'm going to do something about it. That's where the learning is really activated and comes alive. Again, going back to the right, we need to transform our experiences to create that knowledge and learning. Yeah. yeah. And where can it go wrong? So. What's the biggest trap or how can we, what brings an experiential learning workshop or program to fail? Mm. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is either if you don't have the four modes right and then it's not really an experiential workshop if you don't have those four modes um but i think maybe a couple of things i think you know one of the things that i really believe in is that how do we take a holistic approach to learning so i specialize really like experiential learning is the foundation of everything that i do but it's not the only thing that i do right and i am actually I have my own framework and model. I'm in the process of naming it and yeah, like <laughs> doing all the process to really finalize my patent on it. But I think like the, for me, the real intrigue is how do we take all these different facets from our life and how do we spend time for psychological safety? Like we just said, because we can't just, people can't just start with like diving them into an experience. You know, the example I gave before I can't say, okay, hello, everybody. I'm Romy. We're here for facilitation. So you're going to start and facilitate. Go. People will not feel psychologically safe. And right then we are not, we're no longer in the challenge zone. We're in the panic zone. We're learning our brain shuts down and we're in fight, flight, freeze, and nobody can actually learn in that process. So again, it's about how do we integrate experiential learning in the other things that we know we need, like psych safety taking time for people to create the space connection before content all the things that we talked about in our last uh, podcast episode but then it goes further like i said the principles of neuroscience and and learning um 
I, I think it doesn't necessarily have to be that we have an equal, we spend equal time in all the four modes, but I think it can also go wrong when there's such little experience, such little reflecting and so much thinking and so mm. much lecture, right? And then mm. we're again, not tapping into the neuroscience of how people learn. We're not focusing on the generation of information from our group, from those full cups, right? We're not asking questions first and then giving our own insight. We're just telling, telling, telling and trying to fill cups, um, you know, which we know that's not how people learn. P the human brain is not a sponge. Like we think we always use this analogy, like the human brain is like a sponge. We just absorb information. That's actually not true. It's like a sieve, like, you know, when you make tea and, you know, and the water kind of goes through, like, I think that's, that's really what the human brain is like. We'll take and connect with different pieces of the content based on our own past life experience. Mm. Um, and so we need to make sure that we are creating that balance. Um, and of course, you know, like behavior change, I think it's really easy to just say, oh, again, I'm trying to be even more intentional about this, even in a very short workshop online, because for a long time, it was like, okay, it's really hard to go deep into the acting phase. All I can do is, you know, ask people, put something in the chat, you're going to do differently. But I think we need to tap more into what we know about how human beings change. We need to focus more on like, how am I spending time here at the end to really help create accountability systems for the learner and so that they have peer accountability? How am I tapping into what I know about how people change of like, put something in your calendar right now. Don't just say it. And then we close Zoom and you never see it again, but like mark it in your calendar so that next week you'll see it there and you'll actually be triggered to do it all of these different pieces have to come together to create a really holistic learning process. So um, sorry to go back to your original question was where does it go wrong? I think it's yeah, not taking that wider lens and trying to just do these pieces and check off the box. Like I'm doing experience. I'm doing fun. I'm doing thinking. I'm acting. It's again, taking a wider lens to see how, are, what kind of full big picture experience are we creating for our learners? Mm, beautiful. And what remains your number one challenge when you facilitate? Mm. Flash train. <laughs> um, always, I think it's always going to be time. I think late, you know, lately I've been learning a lot about ADHD. Um, and so I've, I've had ADHD my whole life and I never really, thought very deeply about how it impacts my my work and my life it's always been like yeah like you know my brain moves fast and I can sometimes be distracted but that was kind of all I really knew and I've lately been doing a lot of learning to understand ADHD because I also want to not just understand for myself but create more inclusive spaces and really helping and support neurodivergent learners and you know in different realms um so for me personally I learned recently, and I never knew this, that AD, people with ADHD struggle with time management. They call it like time mm -hmm. blindness. And I was like, okay, because every single time somebody asks me, like, what is one of the key areas? I mean, I will always say there's every single time I do a workshop, I'm always writing down, oops, I can do this better. I can improve this. It's not that I think I'm perfect in anything I do. Um, but it's always usually the number one thing I always say. It's like, I always go back to that time management, the because of this time blindness, sometimes I think some, an experience will take a shorter amount of time than it actually does. Uh, the beauty is that again, I can tap into my learning strength. So I know like in case I ever, I've, again, my learning flexibility helps me create more structure, really go deep into the details of the analyzing style. Be like, is that realistic time? Are you being a time optimist when you should be a time pessimist here? Right. And so I'm working on that practice. But I think also then I can lean into my strengths of my learning style of initiating and say, okay, I noticed that I'm running out of time here. Let me tweak this a little bit in the moment without even the participants realizing I had a different plan and it doesn't feel always so rushed. But I think that's always something I want to get better about is like managing time and mm. And um, yeah, and so I, I, I think creating more, the more that we can, I can manage time, the more I, space I have for that acting phase at the end, you know? Yeah. And the concept of, I love the concept of um, time blindness. Mm. And I, 
I read about an experiment that they run, a group of scientists run, where they asked people who are generally always a little bit too late. So they are those who are, they are those people, they are always late. And, <laughs> That's and there are others, they're <laughs> always on time. Um, and I'm German and I don't think it's because I'm German that I'm always on time. It's just... <laughs> And what they found is that the perception of time is indeed different. So they asked a group to, they asked these random people to indicate when they believe that 10 minutes are up or one minute is up. Whereas those who are always on time, they were more accurate in their perception of the time that has elapsed. Whereas those who tend, have a tendency to be late, they totally overestimated 10 minutes <laughs> so after 50 minutes they were like yeah I think 10 minutes are up I actually facilitated this once I did I did a workshop and we had everybody stand up in separate parts of the room we made sure that they couldn't be too, too influenced by the sounds and we said don't count in your head but think you know whenever you feel that it's you feel that it's been one minute sit down and it's like you said some people sat sat down after 40 seconds and some people sat down after three minutes <laughs> it really was amazing experience for us to debrief yeah. on and talk about you know yeah and I think this creates a lot of empathy then also for the latecomers it's they have a different perception of time and it's something we cannot judge and vice and vice versa, you know, yeah. I, I feel bad because I know I was late today for this podcast. But in general, I am really, you know, trying to be more on time. Be well, as a facilitator, I can never be late. That's for one. So that helps. But I think, you know, many years ago, a friend once told me that, you know, when you're late, you send a message to me that your time is more important than mine. And that was a really that was a new experience that mm. struck me and my emotions because I was like, I never want you to think that I think my time is is more valuable. I'm just, I was just like, you know, I left the house at the time that I should have been here because yeah, the time blindness. I, I don't want to use that ever as an excuse because I think it's really important to create empathy and understanding that, you know, yeah. I don't, I, I want to create those safe spaces for everybody. Absolutely. And then it's in the responsibility of those who have time blindness um, to create systems. Um, mm -hmm. I never start a workshop late. So I might wait for two minutes or three minutes because maybe our um, our watches are not adjusted. And even that doesn't count anymore. <laughs> I remember back in the days when I was young, I was like, oh, yeah, but my watch is kind of slower than yours. And on my watch, it's... <laughs> the right time with the digital and the cell phone doesn't work anymore because I think it's um it's sending the signal to those who arrived showed up on time that they are not important enough totally uh, to totally. so that we start for them and I would rather honor those who showed up on time than give them the impression and also it sucks a lot of energy out of the space I think Oh my gosh, this is why we do these unofficial starts, right? It's so important. They I start early, a couple of minutes even before early, and let's engage participants from the moment they walk in the room. Let's celebrate them and honor them and thank them for being on time versus saying, thank you, we'll get started when everyone's here. And then people yeah. get their <laughs> phone out and they're disengaged. Yeah. And yeah, that's not how we want to start yeah. off and kick off the learning yeah. space. I'm, I'm right there with you, Miriam. Yeah. Um... Yeah, although it's um, it really depends then also on the group. So if they're more from the corporate space, I think just giving them the opportunity to close all the time. Okay, you're here. That's great. You showed up on time, but I guess you rushed from the last meeting. So take a moment, write down everything that could distract you, close all the tabs, take a glass of water, stretch. It's absolutely it goes back to right the two categories of experiences we could be in those lower energy like space to really be more calm and restorative energy right like have a mindful moment you know prepare yourself or it could be higher energy like put something in the chat we're gonna have music we're gonna start with the kickoff activity we're gonna do some drawing and annotating yeah. like it really depends what kind of experience you want to create and mm. I think that's why you we mentioned empathy like empathy is such a core skill to have as an experienced designer because 
we need to be, again, putting ourselves in the shoes of our learners and empathizing with their energy over time, with the emotions over time, with all of the different experiences that they're going to have in that full learning cycle and really see how can I adjust um, and adapt my design to like really cater to what I think could be the most helpful and beneficial experience for them. And although I... I'm aware that this could open a Pandora box um, of an entire new episode. Um, I still would like to ask the question since you mentioned the new diversity. Mm. So what are the key elements? Because I can imagine that when you look at new diversity, suddenly you don't have nine learning preferences, but you have a million. Mm. Yes. So how can you possibly cater design in an inclusive way that would allow new um, ADHD participants to engage and to connect to the content or even maybe those who are rather in the spectrum of even um, autism mm. you know I don't want to I'm certainly not an expert in this and I'm learning more myself. I can only share, you know, what I've started to see and what has worked for me from my personal experience. Um, like two quick things that came up for me when you asked that was one is how are we creating more spaces for the co-creation, right? It's not me serving you it's us creating this learning space together so how do I get as many insights from my learners as through as many touch points how do I ask in surveys and questions in emails before they even enter the space what do you need to mm -hmm. like what do you personally need to really maximize this session for you whether that's emotional whether that's through learning whether that's you know I've had some people say I need, you know, I'm, I, I'm absolutely struggle with so much content, I get cognitive overload. So like, could we, I, I really, you know, I do need more visuals instead of concepts. I'm not, it's, it's not about the learning style, but it was a, a very interesting, like, approach. And I was like, okay, that was a great way for me to adapt or, um, you know, even just asking people more what they what they need. I, I think throughout the process, helping people see this is a co-created experience, but it also needs that psychological safety. People need to know that they can come to us. Like I did a training a few months ago and, you know, we, we had a participant who was very open about his autism and he was, because we really laid such a foundation of psychological safety, he really felt comfortable to express even to the group, like, this is what I need from the group, or this is how I operate and this might be different than what you're used to seeing but this is you know this is who I am and just creating that space that he felt he could be unapologetically himself mm -hmm. so he could he could ask for what he needed he could leave the room whenever he needed he could you know express and emote a range of, of emotions based on you know what was coming up and I think that's why psychological safety is just so important because it's easy to say, well, I asked the group, like, what do you need? What do you want? But a lot of times people, it's really hard to articulate one, but second of all, like if we don't feel safe, we can't let our guard down to really express that. Yeah. Um, so True, I, those because, are some, mm, yeah, go ahead. Expressing what we need and what we want is extremely vulnerable. Fear of rejection. Um, and I think it's something that we don't necessarily learn as kids. <laughs> Maybe no. the new generation does. With, I hope. <laughs> well, with all different uh, setbacks or challenges that come along with that. But I, yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, it goes back to the flexibility, like create as many touch points, see, check in, read the room, see what's, see what's being spoken, but see what's being unspoken. And then like check assumptions, like communicate that goes back to the coaching role, right? It's like mm -hmm. some in between, if I'm in person in a session, I might pull someone aside and be like, Hey, I, you know, trying to get to know somebody more and see like, maybe there was, you know, something I missed or am I, you know, is there an assumption I'm making? How can I better create and craft those experiences for that group? Because I don't believe in off the shelf trainings. You can have your 
tried and true, but they always will need to be tailored to those specific mm -hmm. audiences so that we can create more inclusive spaces for everybody and all kinds of learners. Wonderful. Yeah, this sounds very empowering and encouraging. Thank you. I hope so. Thank everyone you. Can, <laughs> everyone can start doing that. Wonderful. One final question. If someone thinks, mm, I'm doing some training, I'm maybe even an educator, what is the one small step that I can take to make the learning more experiential for my groups? Mm, ask questions. If it's like the smallest, littlest thing we can do is just ask more questions. It sounds so simple, but it is so underrated. You know, ask more questions for the group to learn about them. Ask more questions to the group to better see how what you're sharing relates to their personal life experience. Ask more questions before you share the content. See what the participants already know about the topic and then share before, you know, because otherwise, well, first of all, that also taps into, you know, critical thinking more once they've thought about it. The human brain, we love questions, right? We really mm -hmm. are these meaning making machines. If you ask me a question, my brain is already going to start trying to find the answers. And so in the very most basic way, it's just, We can use questions throughout all the modes of the cycle to yeah. create experience, reflect, think, and act. Beautiful. And what I hear is ask questions about the experiences and not questions to which you necessarily know the answer. So uh, don't ask the questions yeah. that are kind of this, <laughs> let me evaluate or let me test you, but let me be curious about you and let me help you to explore the content in your own experience. Actually, that is what I found is one of the key detractors of experiential learning is when you ask leading questions to get because you have a very clear, specific answer in mind and you're trying to get participants to get there. That's this where makes me run away. breaks loose. Yeah, it's this makes me run loose. away. I'm like, <laughs> just spit it out. Give me the answer, but don't treat me like a stupid person. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty, again, of experiential learning is that if we're asking these open-ended questions with genuine curiosity mm. to learn from each full cup, each human being with valuable life experience in that room, then we are opening up possibilities for learning with and from our learners, not a one-directional relationship. What else can we say after that? Well, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Because in the power of questions to wrap up, right? And I think this is something I always, I want to now even be more intentional about with podcasts is like asking the learner, whoever is here listening to this podcast, but also asking you, uh, Miriam, like, what are you taking away from this whole, we've had talked about so many things. And I'm just curious from your own perspective, like what resonated for you and what might you do differently in your own facilitation moving forward? Mm. What resonated or what I'm taking away is that an experience can just be created by a question. Mm. So it doesn't have to be this among us thing and one action that I'm taking away is to be more intentional about the last step of experiential learning of the putting it into action mm -hmm. yes it's nice to debrief um and then and then what go mm -hmm. out and do it yeah lovely thank you, thank you for sharing that with me <laughs> dum, 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 dum. Yay! <laughs> thank you. Ah, oh, thank you. How do 